This morning, I wanted to start with Matthew chapter 9, verse 6. It says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is looking at the masses, the everyone, and this includes the Romans who are his oppressors, the Samaritans who are his people's enemies, the zealots who were local terrorists. And he's taking it all in. And the Bible says that in that moment, Jesus feels compassion. He feels that the people are lost and that they need a shepherd. What is a shepherd? The word creates an image in our heads. We have this idea about what a shepherd is, a caretaker, a leader, a mender, a nurturer. A shepherd is a guide and a protector. A shepherd is a friend. A shepherd is a minister. And when you read the Gospels, what do we see Jesus do? He does three things. He preaches, he teaches, and he heals. He had an all-inclusive ministry of care. When Jesus saw someone in need, he stopped and cared for them. When he sees somebody who's broken, he stops and he nurtures them. When he sees somebody who needs forgiveness, he stops and forgives them. And in our 10-week series, as we head towards Easter, we are saying, come and see Jesus. Come and see a Messiah who is more than we give him credit for. He is everything that we always think of, and he's even more than that. Sometimes he can even be two things at once. He can be a lion and a lamb at the same time. He can be holy and just at the same time. He can be merciful and mighty at the same time. Jesus displayed grace and kindness and compassion and mercy and love at the same time. And he wasn't an alien from another planet, nor was he a judgmental robot who was devoid of feelings. We see in this passage right here that he has emotion. He feels joy, he feels sadness, he feels hunger and loss, and he meets the needs of his people when they are hungry. He brings back those people that were pushed away. And here in this passage we see Jesus has compassion. He sees the people and he says, they need a shepherd. And as his followers, we, the church, as Christians, we are called to do that same thing. We are called to have that same compassion. We said last week that his mission of all needs to be our mission of all. Listen to how the Old Testament prophesied of the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 40. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. God says one day he will come as a good shepherd and the imagery is not soft and demure. No, he does not come as a meek shepherd. He is not weak. Isaiah says that he comes with might and that his arm rules. But then he gently leads. He is not one or the other. He is strong and gentle at the same time. And if you look uh, at Jesus, if I were to take you to him, if I said, come and see Jesus, I would take you to a Messiah who was a strong shepherd. And of course, if Jesus is the shepherd, then that makes us the sheep. And that checks out, right? <laughs> that makes sense. Sheep are not the brightest animals in the world. Sheep find security within the flock. Sheep blindly follow. Yeah, that sounds about like me. So today I want to look at how Jesus is our strong shepherd. Jesus teaches very famously in John chapter 10, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, 
and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. There's a lot here to see. There's a lot here to unpack and to examine. First thing I want you to see is something that is very unique with our shepherd in that our shepherd knows our name, right? Our shepherd knows our name. A mother was once asked by a census taker how many children she had. She replied, well, there's Billy and Harry and Martha and never mind the names. The man interrupted, just give me the number. The mother angrily replied, they don't have numbers. They all have names. Now that might sound like a funny story, but in our modern society, how true is this? How often are you and I referred to as a number? How often are we reduced to a statistic? You fill out a form, what's your social security number? What's your driver's license number? What's your birth date? What's your insurance number? Need help at the store? Trying to pick up something at the pharmacy? Take a what? Take a number. Thankfully, our Savior, Jesus Christ, doesn't see us this way. He knows each and every one of us by our names, just like a shepherd knows each and every one of his sheep in his flock, which means Jesus is a personal shepherd. He knows us. He knows if we are sick or well. He knows if we are with the flock or if we have wandered away. He knows if we are trapped or free. The songwriter, Tommy Walker, sings in his chorus, he knows my name, he knows my every thought, he sees each tear that falls, and he hears me when I call. Jesus calls his own sheep by name. He is a personal shepherd, and he knows, and he cares for every sheep. It's the second thing we see. Well, we see that the sheep know the shepherd's voice. Jesus is our shepherd, and those who truly belong to God listen and believe the words of Jesus, which means since we belong to him, he must always be the voice that we recognize above all other voices. We have to be doing our very best to listen to him and to follow his voice. That's a tough one, isn't it? But why is it so tough? And why is it so important? Well, can we distinguish the truth from falsehood? Can we distinguish his true voice from false voices that would want to take us away. Look at what Jesus says about that. Jesus says he is coming to the sheep pen, right? Well, what would that be? That would be the place where his people are, his people, the Jews, and their religion is Judaism, right? So Jesus is coming to the sheep pen of Judaism because he is speaking to Jewish people right now. And there is this danger of thieves and robbers who speak with a false voice that might try to take his sheep away. Well, that would be the scribes and the Pharisees. They're trying to take away his sheep. Jesus comes calling his own sheep out. And then it says in verse 3 that they listen to his voice and he leads them out of the sheep pen of Judaism and he brings them into the rich pastures of the gospel. How is Jesus able to do that? Because the sheep know his voice. And as a good shepherd, he speaks truth. And as sheep, our job is to isolate that truth. We focus in on Jesus and we separate his voice out from all the others. In Numbers chapter 27, Moses is about to die. And like any good shepherd, Moses' dying thoughts, his prayers, are with his sheep, the people. And so Moses prays a prayer in this chapter, and his prayer is later answered. It's answered when, in the passage we're reading, John chapter 10. Moses prays in number 27, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation, who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep that have no shepherd. Moses knew, just like Jesus knew, that the people needed a shepherd. Otherwise, they would wander off. We can identify with that, can't we? Sure we can. We, we see that. 
without a strong connection to Jesus, people leave the church. People leave the faith. They leave the community of the saints. They ignore the Bible. They neglect prayer. And instead, they become consumed in worldly things. They listen to worldly voices. They listen to false voices. And many of those people can't find their way back. People need a shepherd. They need leadership. Moses knew that. And there is an amazing answer given to Moses' prayer for a shepherd. In answer to Moses' prayer, a young man is brought forward, a young man by the name of Joshua. The very next verse says, So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Joshua is chosen to succeed Moses. Which is interesting, because Joshua and Jesus have the same name. Joshua is Hebrew. It's the Hebrew name for Jesus. So God's real answer to Moses' prayer, whom Joshua then is a foreshadowing of, right? He's pointing towards, is Jesus. Jesus comes as the good shepherd for the congregation. Jesus comes as the good shepherd to lead the people out of legalism and to bring them into the green pastures of forgiveness, the green pastures of the gospel, the green pastures of grace. Jesus is the new Joshua, and he is the new and perfect shepherd. Returning back to John chapter 10, where we're reading, Jesus warns about thieves and robbers who try to break in and harm or steal the sheep away, and he gives us a way to recognize them. In verse 1, he says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. Who do you recognize as a thief and a robber? Jesus says, the people that don't come in through the official gate. What does that mean? Well, he tells us in verse 7, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. But the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Okay, so what does that mean? It means anyone who says that there is another way to God, that there's another gospel, there's another revelation, another method. Maybe you can get there by your own effort. You can access salvation some other way. Here, I have, I have the Bible part two. Jesus says, watch out for people who reject the gospel. Watch out for people who reject the cross. Jesus died. He died for you. He was resurrected. Watch out for people who try to promote some other means of salvation. You can tell who those people are just by listening to them. They can talk a lot about religious subjects. They might even know a lot of Bible verses, but their message is not the cross. The passion of their lives is not Jesus. Jesus says, don't enter through another door. If you see anyone trying to enter in through another door, they're trying to sneak in some other way. They are thieves and robbers. This is why Easter is so important. This is why the road to the cross is so important. This is why a 10-week series on Jesus is so important. I want you to come and see Jesus. I want you to see the true and authentic. I want you to recognize the true and authentic Jesus. And when Jesus has given us this way, that we can recognize his voice. He's given us this way to recognize him and recognize truth when we hear it. Then it should change us in such a way that we immediately now can identify all false voices, which means our shepherd is also our leader. And we follow him. Jesus is the strong shepherd. He comes and he lifts his sheep out of the pen where the thieves and the robbers are, and then he leads them out that's what it says in verse 3, right? In context, he's referring to leading the sheep out of Judaism, out of legalism, out of uh, the harm's way of robbers and thieves, people who would harm his sheep, lead them astray. 
He leads them out of a religion where people are constantly trying to earn God's favor. He leads them away from self-harm. He leads them away from insecurities and self-doubt. He leads them away from thinking that they're not good enough. He leads them away from thinking that they don't measure up. He leads us away from all the voice, voice, false voices, and he brings us to a place of comfort. You know, all through this that we've been reading so far, the imagery that keeps popping up in my head is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. King David, who wrote this, was also a shepherd at one time in his life. And now, as an older man, he looks back and he compares his God with the shepherd who leads. Jesus leads. He leads us out of broken religion where you have to fulfill all of the law's demands because you can't. He knows it's impossible, so he has to save you. He fulfilled all of the law's demands on the cross. Jesus, the good shepherd, doesn't make his sheep do the work. Instead, he rescues his sheep and then he leads them to green pastures. He leads them to still waters. And this is where the sheep can finally take comfort and the Bible says relax. They know they have nothing to fear. Darkness can't hurt them. Evil can't hurt them because Jesus is the strong shepherd. Their shepherd will lead them and protect them. What does verse 11 say? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Our shepherd protects. You know what's funny is we read that and we've read it so much now we don't even bat an eye. We think to ourselves, yeah, well, of course, of course he does. But what shepherd would ever do that? I mean, who, who of you has a pet? You have a pet? Raise your hand. You have a pet right? You have a pet. Now, who of you would lay down your life for your pet? But see, this is why the skittish and dumb sheep can relax, because they know that their shepherd would risk it all to protect them. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The picture here is of a shepherd protecting his sheep, even at the cost of his own life. So notice how closely the heart of the shepherd is bound up in the safety and protection of the sheep. He would rather die than let any harm come to his sheep. Again, listen to King David in, in 1 Samuel 17. David is going to go off. He's going to fight Goliath. And everyone's worried about him. And David says to Saul, he tries to reassure him. He says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. A lion or a bear. Now that's a shepherd. Can you imagine running after a lion, grabbing your sheep out of the lion's mouth, and when it turns on you, you grab its hair and you hit it. <laughs> you strike it until it dies. That's a strong shepherd. That's a shepherd whose sheep sleep well at night. But what about Goliath, David? Aren't you afraid of Goliath? David says in verse 36, your servant has struck down both lions and bears and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them for he has defiled the armies of the living God. This is how I picture it. David looks, he spits. Yeah, I can do this. Piece of cake. That guy doesn't look much bigger than a bear. Be back in five. Right? In fact, we always draw these pictures of David going after Goliath and all he has is a slingshot. But that's not true. If you keep reading verse 38, 
It says, then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. And then he took his staff in his hand. And he chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? What does David bring to the fight? His sticks, right? His rod and his staff. Just like when he writes in the book of Psalm, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Our shepherd, Messiah, is not some demure, soft, quiet, blue-eyed, skinny guru. Jesus is the shepherd, but he is the shepherd like his great, great, great grandfather, David. He is the strong shepherd. He is a mighty leader. He is a warrior shepherd. So what's the takeaway for us? What assurances do we have? Well, what about you? I mean, think about your own life. Are there robbers and thieves around you trying to take you away? Are there false voices speaking into you? Is there a bear or a lion trying to haul you away? First Peter 5 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a what? Roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Hey, sheep, <laughs> listen up. You are being carried away by sin. You can get so caught up in the jaws of the devil that you can be carried away and hauled off into darkness. You can be carried away by doubt. You can be carried away by fear. You know what? I, I would have loved to have played with my kids in all of that snow. All that snow we had, I, that, it looked like a lot of fun. It really did. But the snow outside wasn't fun. And it wasn't a fun memory. The church had damage, you had damage, our neighbors had damage. And it'd be easy for us to be afraid right now, to let fear take hold of us, worried about the repairs that have to get done, and maybe even doubly worried, what if this happens again? Hey, sheep, don't be carried away by fear. Remember who your shepherd is. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That means he's got you. He's got you. King David risked his life for his sheep, but King Jesus died for his sheep. This wasn't an empty promise that Jesus made. He actually did it. Your strong shepherd went straight to the cross for you because of love, right? Because of love. It all comes back to love. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. That's the good news of the gospel. It's the message of the Bible, and that message is told on every single page. You read any page in the Bible, and the message is, I lay down my life for the sheep. I die that you may live. I die to forgive you. I die to bear your sins in my body. I die to pay the penalty of sin. I die to rescue you from Satan. I die to save you from God's wrath. I died to set you free. He loves you. He knows your name. And my response to that love, my response to the good shepherd as a sheep. John 10, 4 says, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow and they will flee from him. He leads, I follow. That's it, right? He leads, I follow. That's what it means to be a Christian. He loves us, 
and we follow him because we love him. Let me ask you something. If there's something keeping you from following, what is it? What keeps you from following Jesus? What distraction in your life is so much more important than being close to the protection of your strong shepherd? You know, when I was in second grade, I was the smallest kid in my school. Second grade, I was the smallest kid in my school. Do you know who my best friend was? Kurt. <laughs> Literally the biggest kid in the entire school. Kurt was as tall as my mom. Why is it important to follow the shepherd so closely? Protection. No question. My king laid down his life for me. I love him. So nothing is more important in my life. Absolutely nothing. Nothing is the topic of my conversation. Nothing more is the topic of my emails or uh, the, the things that I think about or the discussions I have with my family and friends. Nothing is more important. But you know what another beautiful thing about following Jesus is? He doesn't expect us to remain a sheep. We don't have to stay sheep. No, in fact, he wants us to emulate his son. He wants us to also be shepherds. Peter says in chapter 5, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. In 1 Peter chapter 5, God sets the role of the shepherd in the church, telling them to serve as overseers and leaders, but not because they have to, but because they want to, because they love the church. You know, as our own church starts to come back to life and people start coming back and attending, we also need our children and youth ministry to come back to life. It's our turn. It's all of our turn to now take young children by the hand and say, come and see Jesus. That responsibility, that's on us. We are asked not to remain sheep, but to also become shepherds for the next generation. And I know your church says this all the time. Your church says, we need teachers. We need volunteers. Help us teach Sunday school. Help us lead Vacation Bible School. And we grumble and we shuffle our feet and we begrudgingly say, well, if I have to. No, Peter says, not under compulsion, willingly, eagerly. Why? Why would anyone want to serve or lead willingly? Love. Love is always the motivator. Do you love your church? Do you love your church? Do you love the people in your church? Then become a shepherd. Pick up the rod and the staff. And adopt a spirit of leadership. Adopt a spirit of strength and love and serve your church. And then what does Peter say will happen next? He says in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. You see, one day, our strong, good shepherd, our chief shepherd will appear, and we will see him. And the Bible says that on that day, he hands you a crown. What? a promotion to go from sheep to shepherd to crown of glory. Pray with me. Lord, more than ever, we want those green pastures. We want those still waters. Living now in over a year of lockdown, isolation, COVID, vaccines, and election, we are tired and broken. We have mental weariness, physical tiredness, being locked up, cooped up, homeschooling. 
Lord, there is worry and doubt. There's fear. And there are real tears in our lives. Now more than ever, we need to be following our Good Shepherd, allowing him to lead us beside still waters, green grass, good pastures. Lord, when you left us down here with your mission, you left us knowing that the church would be the rock, the church would be the voice, the church would be the stability in people's lives, the church would be the conduit by which you advanced your kingdom. And now as we draw closer and closer to the end of COVID, as we draw closer and closer to shedding our masks and being free, as the church doors swing open again and people flood back, now more than ever, we need more shepherds. Your churches all across America need more shepherds, more leaders, more people that are willing to step up and to take all the people by the hand and to say, come and see. Come and see Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, if you're listening to us on MP3. Of course, you can always download this and save it to your phone. You can listen to it while you're out running or jogging or listen to it in the car. Uh, you can also clip and copy the address up at the top and share that to your own Facebook wall. Share it with your friends. Let other people know that uh, this is your church and this is what uh, you are listening to. Thanks for watching, guys. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.